Welcome to the Decentralized Opportunity Podcast. This is our weekly podcast where we discuss discuss innovative ideas in business and technology from unconventional and often overlooked sources. I'm your host, Tanner Lytle, and I'm here with my co-host, Wyatt Carson. Nailed it, Tanner. Yeah. If people would only realize how many times we try to do an intro and keep ourselves muted and mess up everything, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's normal. It's process in the works. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, how the sauce is just made. No one really knows. <laughs> it's best you don't know. Yeah. How so been? I've been good. I've been busy. I have lots of stuff going on, and I'm excited to kind of dive into the different concepts. Mm-hmm. As we discussed last week, um, we started the Founder University um, Cohort 4, and the first week was just absolutely f- phenomenal. So kind of want to do a quick recap of that, and then we can kind of jump into some of the concepts we've been learning this week. Love it. Love it. All right. Key takeaways from week, week one. Let's start with the class itself because there's a week, there's a class and then there's a midweek check-in. So the class itself, what, what were some of your key takeaways? Well, first of all, just understanding what they're looking for and how specific that is for investment. Um, you have to be a certain kind of C-Corp, you have to be in certain areas, and certain venture capitalist firms will really focus on specific areas that they know that they'll invest in. So it's not one of those wild, I have an idea and anyone's just going to invest in me. It's got to be very specific to tie who you want to partner up with, with what their skill set is, which makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, we'll talk about this more in detail in, in a little bit, but, you know, investors don't give away thousands, sometimes millions of dollars to anyone. And you, there's, there's criteria to it. And I know that might come as a shock to some people, but yeah, there's, there's some criteria. And more importantly, you, you have to, you have to be a little stand out. You, you have to have a little of that secret sauce. I don't know what that secret sauce is per se, but that's the point of this, this founders university. Cause it did talk about some response, some, some characteristics of a good founder. We talked a little bit about that. And, uh, some of them were like a, a gut punch to me. It's like, Oh, I don't have that skill. But some, I was like, oh, okay, okay. I could fit into that category. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually was talking with my wife, Emily, cause she listens to last week's pod last week's podcast and was like, Oh man, how many, like everyone's in different parts of their lives. I don't know if we would be ready to give up everything we own, get in massive debt, ask people to forego their, you know, paychecks for our business. Would we? And it's like, well, you just, it depends on what's important for you, but we're definitely in a different stage of our lives where we have more at risk. And so we have to be more calculated and to those risks. When I was 20 Mm -hmm. and to 30, I had basically nothing to my name and I just worked all the time and I was willing to sacrifice every night, morning, weekend to the cause that was the store. Um, But now we have different priorities and we need to be more focused, specific uh, on the decisions that we make and hedge those risks a little bit differently. Yeah. And, and similar, different, 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 stages. Um, I had my first kid when I was 19. I have had young kids forever. And now that I'm getting older, unfortunately, as my wife likes to often remind me, uh, my kids are getting a little older and it's kind of allowing me some breathing room to begin exploring some of these opportunities. So you're spot on in stages. You have a, you have a baby. Um, and that changes your world. Um, you know, my youngest is now almost seven years old and going to school and gone, you know, five days a week doing that stuff and getting their own hobbies. And, uh, it's allowing me a little bit more flexibility in my life to begin exploring options like starting a business. So you're absolutely right that every person's different. Everyone goes through stages and, and, uh, more importantly, I'm jealous. Your wife listens to the podcast. Mine doesn't. So, yeah. Um, the other thing that I really took away from it was just, again, and it was bringing up memories of back in the day, how much work it is. And one of the things yeah. even from this week was, oh, you uh, next Thursday that we're skipping a week for a midweek check-in because of Thanksgiving, of course. But so a week from Thursday, which is nine days from where, when we're recording this, yeah. they were talking about, oh, we'll have your landing page ready and all these other things and we'll critique it. 
I'm not ready for that yet. I, I, we you just know. came in with a, a, you know, an idea and a dream to start. Yeah, and even all there, of a, sudden, a, vague, a vague idea at the best. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So it's just how quick you want to move and how much you want to dedicate to these things. And they pulled up a website that someone built over the weekend, just, and it was fantastic. So you realize the caliber yeah. of peers that we're with and how much we need to make sure we're stepping up to, to keep along. You know, that brings up a good point because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we, we kind of talked about it in one of podcasts a couple, a couple of episodes ago. I don't know, but you know, imposter syndrome and things like that and being in this cohort and meeting these people and seeing their skill set, it's intimidating. Um, like, wow, do I have the, the secret sauce? Do I have what it takes to be a founder to do this stuff? Um, but then I was, I was talking to my wife about it because she's really excited for it and, it dawned on me that like, you know, we got here, we, we have you and me, we got here, we're in this program with 300 other 298 other people. Uh, and we're there for a reason. Uh, a lot of people wanted to be in this cohort and didn't get to do it, but you and I did. So I keep thinking about that. It's like, maybe I just need to pump the brakes and think maybe we've got something here. And at the very least, just be confident in myself. If, if not, and it all burns to the ground, I'm going to learn a lot. But uh, you're right. High caliber, high caliber, caliber people, and um, in fact, some of them. Hopefully, we can talk to in the near future, right? Absolutely. And so on Thursdays, they have this midweek check-in, and to kick it all off, they did this version of speed dating, where they took the hundred or so people that were showed up for that Zoom session, and they broke them into different um, breakout rooms. And so there was anywhere from like three to five people in each room and you got a minute to do your little elevator pitch. And granted, no one was really prepared for this. Most people don't have an elevator pitch. So it's really putting yourself on the spot. And one, again, just to reiterate, everyone in those uh, breakout rooms were fantastic and had some just incredible so cool. ideas. Uh, there was a few that were, you know, very early stage like we are. And then there were some with fully full products that they, we could go to their website, we could sign up, they're asking for feedback on. Um, so, you know, just a wide stage of it. But I was really, it really boosted my confidence because I came up with a quick elevator pitch about, you know, helping you build a better business to run, not a business that runs you, which is a problem that I faced so much in my life. And I've seen so many other entrepreneurs and business owners really have that problem where they, start something great and it ends up just consuming them and you serve the business rather than the business serving you. And everyone w was really intrigued by that and interested. And I got a lot of messages and on the circle platform, on LinkedIn, on all these places of people who wanted to learn more about our products. So I'm like, well, there's a shell of it. There's a good idea wrapped in this that we need to fully flesh out. Yeah. And, and I'm excited to have these like-minded people because we really are building this product for people like ourselves and what's better than people who are willing to invest money, time and effort <laughs> into building a business. That's exactly what we want to do. Then the, like you said, the 300 or 400 people that are in this kind of platform, this, this yeah. boot camp. They are, you're, you're absolutely right. And yes, there's some that already have a product and there's some that already have thousands of dollars in sales every month and all, and it, it, it all, and there are some people who have zero intention of building a product. They are purely in this to learn about being a founder and about starting a business. And maybe someday it'll come in handy, but they have zero intention of starting one. Uh, it, it really runs the full spectrum and you're, you're right. The very first breakout session I had was with Jason and I was very first to go and, and it was like, you know, what's your name, what's your idea, your strengths and your weaknesses. And, uh, I got to the idea and I was like, you know, we're really just playing with the idea and I, I'm not quite positive yet where this is leading. Um, and then he just kind of mo moved me along. He's like, okay, what's your strength? I was like, crap, I really missed that opportunity. So I made up for it. Uh, and so I finished it out and we finished that, that little breakout session. And then we did like five others and every single session I was in, I took notes for the entire group. I dictated who went next. I always went first and I just, I, I, I went into consultant Wyatt mode and facilitated every meeting and you know what, but my pitch got better and what I was doing got better. And I met some amazing people and same thing, side conversations. I've had like 10 people add me on LinkedIn and 
the community is just so cool. Everyone's just so supportive and everyone's like, yeah, we're all kind of dumb, but we're also pretty smart and we've got these wonderful ideas and we're hoping to get smarter and everyone's just kind of on the same level. And that's, there's, there's no judgment and that's really a cool piece of it. Yeah. I'd like to dive a bit deeper into what you were saying about what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. One of the things that he talked about was there's different areas that a startup needs uh, to be successful. One yeah. is, is a technical person, someone who can actually build the product, at least the technical aspects of the product. And then there's kind of that designer, the user experience, customer experience person that can make that pretty interactive layer that looks appealing is shows a good brand um the part that customers want to use and actually want to use it and continue to use it um there's the product manager portion of it um and then what were some other ones that he talked about so the 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 top three Mm -hmm. was developer designer and product manager those are the top three. And then, of course, project management is, is, is valuable. Operations experience, sales and marketing. Sales, that's sales and marketing are huge. And, and actually, there are a lot of people who are actively looking for people within sales or marketing to bounce ideas off of. So it, 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 it takes all kinds. There are some very essential ones you need, especially if you're building a SaaS product. You need a designer. You need a developer, right? Um, but yeah, sales, marketing, operations experience, and then that product management or project management, um, also, uh, pretty valuable. So yeah. it, you but don't it have pretty- to be someone who, who knows the ins, in, ins and outs of every coding language ever, and has built a hundred apps to start a business. You need to find your skill set, and you need to align with other people who, you know, are, are making up for what you're lacking and together yeah. you create this full picture. And that's, that's what he was trying to get across. Yeah, well, and he also stressed, you know, having an idea is important, being a, a, quote, idea man, but you have to bring more to the table than just idea. And I think that's kind of really where I want to lead this episode, um, talking about, one, doing the work. And then the other thing that kind of came up in this week's lessons, um, and it's been a theme, you know, since we started, but um, things aren't just owed to you. Just because you have a good idea doesn't mean that everything else is going to just magically fall into place and that you're entitled with your good idea to find a good developer, a good designer, a good product person. You really have to put in the work and effort, whether that's learning the skills yourself or supplementing with co-founders or employees or different things like that. Totally. And I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what early stage venture capital is for is you either find a co-founder who fills in the gaps that you are lacking to help support and build this product, or you have to pay for it. This is, this, this, these things aren't free. Uh, people's time and skill sets and knowledge and experience are not free. Hopefully you can make a wonderful connection and find someone who is kind of your yin to your yang, so to speak, and, and makes the whole circle. But if not, yeah, you've, you've got to put in, you either have to build it yourself or you have to find someone to do it. And that, that's the, the truth of it all. You're not going to be able to force people to do anything. And your, your amazing charisma probably won't just attract the world's greatest developers. That's not how it works. Sometimes you've got to start and build your own thing. For example, um, we're exploring no code options right now, not for really an MVP necessarily, but really a ground concept, right? And no code being, Tanner, you're not a coder. I'm not a coder. Like you probably have a bit more experience than I do in that, but neither of us are capable of building a product or especially the product that we're discussing. But you, you are a designer, you are a graphic designer, you, you have UX UI experience and you can build kind of a wireframe, a shell of the idea to, to start moving along. And we can use that as a platform to maybe find that next piece of the puzzle, the developer, the coders, all of that stuff. But yeah, not not owed. Oh man, everyone in the world has a business idea, and everyone thinks that if they only had that that momentum or that that breakthrough connection, they can make it happen. This is not how it works. No, and I see so much just in my personal life. I've ran into this um, throughout my professional life, and then through you know entrepreneurs or ideas or whatever stage you get, you can fall into a rut where you just you think that it should just fall together for you or other people should give you certain things. I mean, how many times are you at, have you been at your job and you just expect, Oh, 
well, my boss will, will do that for me, or they'll give me that promotion, or they'll give me that account, or um, I'll get the next customer, for example. You know, that sale isn't entitled to me or whatever that that part is. And really, that's not the case. And you shouldn't have that mindset because, one, no one else might know that you want that thing. Two, if you constantly express it, no one's going to be want to be around you because you're just being needy and asky, asking. And you can quickly grow resentful once you don't get things that you feel that you're entitled to. And it's very liberating for one to just not have any expectations that anyone's going to do those things, but that you're going to put in the work and take those opportunities or provide assistance, which just happens to open up opportunities. I mean, I'm sure there's so many times in your life where you were just helping and good things happen because you were helping. Um, I, I can think absolutely it. Yeah. It always feels like when I was doing sales, every time that I was busy and I didn't want to even think about it, those were our best sales days. I wasn't trying to make a sale. I was just doing good work and trying not putting extra expectations or um, pressure on those things. And it just seems to fall into place. So, uh, you know, I, I'm really trying to take these aspects in all, all th sorts of my life, pieces of my life where one, don't just expect people are going to do the work for me because I need to be the one who does that because most people are just thinking about themselves anyway. Mm -hmm. And then two, um, be a little bit more helpful for others and then they'll be again, more reciprocating. So you wouldn't even have to ask that's the other part and just happy accidents come from that. Okay. No, absolutely. Spot on being helpful and just going out to do what you want to do and what, what is impactful to you and what's valuable to you doing good work. Like you said, usually goes way further than striving for something. Every time in my career, I've ever been like a promotions up or a, a, a spot I, I want to move up to in, in a company <clears throat> opens up and I think, Oh, I've got this in the bag. I'm, I'm a shoe in every single time I've done that. I've never gotten that promotion. And I can remember a very distinct point in my life where my career today started all because my boss asked if I would help her with a favor. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I've got some free time. And 13 years later, this is my career based of what that task she asked me, just being helpful and, and wanting to genuinely be a good person and do good work has done way more for me than wishing, you know, it's, 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 it's and, it, and it goes the same with entrepreneurship. You can wish and dream. And we talked about this in like episode one, you can read all the books and listen to all the podcasts in the world. But if you don't start and build something and have, start making those connections and start doing whatever, making a podcast, who knows if you don't just start and take that first leap, you're never going to get anywhere. No one's going to come and steal the idea from your head, build it, and then give you all the credit. That's not how the world works, right? No. And I just think back to how many times in my life where I had an idea, well, let's even take this, this business one, for example, the immediate thing for me was like, I have this great idea, quote, great idea. Who knows if it's actually any good or not, <laughs> because it's one, it's just an idea, but how oh, I know all these people, they'll, they'll clearly give us money so we can build this thing. Even mm -hmm. though I haven't done any work, there's no, nothing to show them. You know, I'm, I'm just banking on people know me, my reputation, those things. And maybe to a certain degree that can work with friends and family, or if you do have a very proven track record of delivery in the past, but I hadn't, I hadn't done any work yet. And all the expectations that I had just weren't realistic until you actually start doing the work. And even then, if you're going to go into this and think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do here and I'm going to have people give me all sorts of money to invest and build this product. Well, one, how do you know you actually need that? Um, one of the things that they talk about this week is venture capital comes with all sorts of expectations tied to it. And one, do you need that? It comes with the dilution of your stake in the company. So that's another part, but also it's, they compare it to rocket fuel and you wouldn't want to put rocket fuel in a, on a bike or on a skateboard or in a car. Cause if you do that, and then their example, they talk about it'll explode. If rocket fuel is for rocket ships, is your idea a rocket ship? Can it 
go the distance that if it had that injection to need. And so many ideas are not that. And you have the wrong wants and the wrong expectations and the wrong dreams for your idea. And that, again, is just going to lead you to crash and burn and be resentful. And ultimately, once you hit a roadblock, you're not going to see your way out of it. And you're just going to stop doing it. And that's the biggest thing that I want to avoid is having over-grandized expectations and then feeling like I'll never achieve it and just giving up. But if we have small or no expectations or just expectations of what we're going to do in this next week or on this next day or the next hour or next step, well, I can get there. I can do this next item on my checklist. I can make sure I get some work done tomorrow. I'm going to hit that darn goal nine days from now for having a nice landing page because people are going to be looking looking for it. And I don't want to show up with you know, no homework to class. So. Yeah, I think – the key, and you, you said it there a couple times, is the word expectations. It's important to not have expectations about what you're owed, where you think this is going to go. You're going to build this amazing product, and in two years, you're going to be a millionaire. But expectations on yourself is valuable because, as we just said, this is hard work. Uh, we don't even have a product, Tanner, and I'm feeling like, holy cow, I'm spending hours and hours on this. still have my normal job. We still have families. We still have all these pieces and puzzles. And as we go along, the list of to-dos gets longer and longer. So the expectations, they're not expectations on you or your partner or the world at large or whatever demographic you're trying to reach with your product or business idea. The expectations should be on yourself. And that's a powerful force when you set your expectations of yourself higher than usual. You don't want to set them so high you're failing and you're destined for failure, but you want to challenge yourself, especially in something like starting a business. The risk is high, especially if you do it like an idiot. I'm just be blunt here. Suck at mincing words. I say that all the time. You have to do it with a passion and a purpose, and you have to do it in an intelligent way so that you don't sacrifice everything you've already done, you don't hurt other people, and you don't burn those relationships. So expectations on yourself, on the work you want to do, and providing that good work, taking the, exactly what you said, this is a 12-week program, and at the end of 12 weeks, they don't expect us to have a fully fledged product and selling thousands of units a month or whatever that is. They expect you to have a fleshed out idea and an MVP. That's it. And that's cool. 12 weeks to take you step by step to teach you how to be a founder and develop a product. That's awesome. That seems rational and reasonable to me. Yeah, exactly. And just to translate this over to, you know, people who might be listening and interested in starting their own business and stuff too. The first part, of course, is just start doing the work. Again, if you have an idea, that's fantastic, but you really can't do anything with that idea. It's really on, only until you start fleshing it out on paper, start building that product, start talking to real people that could be your customer to find what their true wants are. Again, someone might tell you they want something once, and you might just grandize that into thinking everyone wants the same thing. But until you really start talking to lots and lots of people, um, then you won't know. And then also just really understanding is now the right time to do that. And why are you the one to do that? That's the other thing that's yes. so important. I think that oh, actually man, that reminds me of a that. note. Yes. I'm getting my handy dandy notebook from this course out because it reminds me of something I wrote down. Let me find it real quick. Okay. Yeah. The other things I'll just kind of touch on. Yeah. So what problems do you want to solve? Why do you, why do you want to solve it? That's the other thing that I was thinking about recently too. Um, do you want to just sol to solve it because there's money in it? Well, what if there isn't a lot of money right away? Are you still going to be motivated to want to do that? So there's all these main things you want to make sure you're getting into it for the right reasons and then you'll stick with it. Did you find your note? Yeah, I think you were going down the exact same path I was. It, it was a set of like five questions, four questions. The first one is, what problem do I want to solve? This is the imagination. This is, I had a dream stage. This, what problem do I want to solve? Is it a problem? That's probably a good question. But the next question is, why do I want to solve it? Not, not why do I think I'm the best person to solve it? I'm probably not the best person to solve any problem in the world. Uh, who am I? But why do I want to solve this problem? Uh, the next question is, what is the quickest way to build an MVP or test the idea? All of the and, and, and we kind of broke this down into more subcategories. All of the Google search in the world, all of the Google searches in the world are not as valuable as going out and talking to your potential customers. 
talking to human beings. Google's great to give you an idea if, if, if it's like maybe a valid idea, but the best way is to talk to human beings. Find the people who would potentially be interested in whatever product or service you're thinking of and talk to them about it. I have nothing to sell. You're not selling them anything. You just want to talk to them. And then finally, where do your potential customers hang out, which is valuable for that previous step? Find out who your customer is and talk to them. If they're not interested and they say, oh, but what about that? Or, you know, maybe they could they could prevent you from going down a long, painful, expensive path simply by just talking and making those connections early. So I found that valuable. What's the problem? Why me? Can I talk to people? How do I validate it? How do I get something out there to show people and, and find out where my potential customers live? Mm-hmm. Well, this lead, leads us because you're talking about building a product is speed to market, particularly. Um, so you have this idea. You don't want to invest a ton of time, effort, money into something that ultimately is going to be proven to not be worth doing. So being able to be, you know, bootstrap yourself, not invest the other part too. You know, we talked about, I'm not a developer. You're not a developer. If we had this mm-hmm. great idea and we went out to some third party software consulting firm to build our product, they're going to take our money. They're going to take a lot of money <laughs> yeah. to, to do this. They're going to make exactly what we ask for. But there's a saying that I always have with sales is there's a difference between just taking the order um, and, and actually doing sales. And the difference is really people, what they ask for isn't always what they need. So you need to really understand what the need is and how to deliver, deliver to that want. So if you're going and you're just spending all this money to, we would spend all this money to develop it, we would get there and find that there's no audience. Well, we just burned a ton, bunch of time and money and resources. Why can't we bootstrap that, build something ourselves that's a little more simple to start, maybe using these no code tools or just at least validating the idea through mockups and examples and videos and getting feedback that way. And then shaping the product to the exact customer needs as quickly as possible. If we're onto something, fantastic. If we're not, ditch it for the next idea. It's perfectly yep. fine. Maybe again, sometime in the future, some new tech comes out and there is a need for it, or there's a different situation in business or the world or how people do something. And then our original idea might be more valid, but we need to figure that out quick. Yeah, exactly. What's, what's more valuable, making an MVP, testing it, talking to your potential audience, validating your idea. And if it's good, you can move forward with that or and if there's anyone listening to this podcast that, that wants to loan Tanner and I 150k uh, with zero expectations, you know, please email me. But or we could spend that 150k, take it to a company, build exactly what's in your head and what I envision, and put it all together, make it pretty. And then what? Then what? We don't have customers. We don't have customer buy-in. We didn't use the voice of the customer. We used our own heads and what we thought was a brilliant idea. Blew half a mortgage to make this thing and and it could be a dud versus iterating. Love the word iteration. Iteration is, is my buzzword for my life. Small steps, small steps get you there versus dumping six figures instantly into something that you think will win. And then being sad, very sad when that money's gone and you've got a pretty product that no one wants. Or even just a feature here or there, um, you know, with what we were talking about, the first dream idea I had for it was way too big. And even Wyatt, when I told him, he's like, that seems great, but we're just going to take one piece of this and then we'll see if that's a good idea first. And then we can build out stuff later. But even of that small piece, I, when I when we were doing that speed dating thing last Thursday, I was talking a little bit more in depth with somebody about the features. I'm like, oh, well, why w- there's already a million of this part of that out there. Couldn't I just use that? And I'm like... Yeah. So why do I need to develop it? Maybe we could tie into that or someone else could use whatever tool they want and we just connect to ours using that act, that area of it. So again, if we would just have come up with the dream and built it, it might not work out for what people's true needs are. And they might only use, if we were building a theoretical building, they might only use one small part of it and then have all these empty, useless rooms. But if we, 
build the space around organically what people are want, wanting. Like you said, you iterate, you have a space that'll always be full and used and utilized and be a lot more efficient. So yeah, that's and where valuable. we want to go. And valuable, yeah. valuable to your customer and value, valuable to your pocket. How do you make money off of a, off an idea? Making something people will buy. And that's what iteration's for. You listen to those. You and you you talk to the customers. They say, "Hey, your product's cool. It'd be really cool if it could do this." And you're like, "You're right. It would be cool. Let me build that." And then now someone else down the road is going to be like, "Oh, I didn't know you had that function. That another customer gave you that idea." But anyways, one thing that cracked me up this last week: um, everyone is so scared of people stealing their ideas when they think they have just like the golden business idea. I'm the next Silicon Valley unicorn. Everyone's like. Do I make people sign NDAs before I tell them my business idea? And how do I get a patent and a trademark? And uh, they, uh, the the people who are running launch, you know, they kept saying it, and I kept giggling to myself the entire time. They're like, if if someone steals your idea, that means it's good. Let's let's start there. That means you've got something. And more importantly, the vast majority of people have zero desire to put in the work to make your idea reality. If someone steals it, cool. But what you're saying is speed the market work on it, get started, build it fast. And someone may very well copy you, but you're going to be out there first and you're going to be the person listening to the customers and you're going to be the person building and improving the product. Someone might make a, a shady, you know, version of yours. <laughs> That's fine. You're going to have the better product because you're following the steps. You're getting to the market fast and you're iterating with customer input. So, well, and the other thing too, is there's, um, a lot of companies that weren't first to market, but did iterate on a good idea and just executed it better. Um, I believe Uber was one of those things. There was already cars out there, yep. but you can take, you don't have to be first and think, oh, someone has this idea. I'm done. Um, you more, again, going back to you build the product, you talk to customers, you figure out what those tr true needs are. And if you work hard and you build you have good people around you, build a good team around you to execute it well, your product's going to be superior. And the biggest thing I think is basically word of mouth. It's referrals. doesn't matter how much you spend. If you have happy customers, you're going to grow because they're going to want to share it with you or with other people. Um, so I, there's something personally so validating for humans in general, when they have something good to share it with their friends and family, you know, there's a good restaurant that just opened up. You want to be the first one to say, go to this restaurant and order the hamburger or chicken wings or get this dish because I had it and it was amazing. And then if they go there and they had it and you, they'll report back to you. You have just such a great sense of satisfaction that you did something great. Well, that business didn't pay marketing dollars to get that new person in. They just did a great job with you. And then that organically spreads. So happy customers are just going to grow exponentially rather than just you were the first one there. Or maybe you're the most recognizable one to start. Doesn't matter. Yeah. And you pick any app idea, go to your app store, Apple, Android, doesn't matter. There's 10 apps that do the exact same thing, sort of, but there's always going to be one that does it better. And there's always going to be one that has more downloads. And those two usually are identical. They do it better and they get more traction. That's, that's just yeah. people like quality. Yep. The other thing that you mentioned was where do my potential customers hang out at? So this is one I wanted to kind of touch on this because of our whole theme of you don't necessarily have to be in Silicon Valley or a big city. You can be in McCook, Nebraska, like me, and still find potential customers. And so I have been talking with a bunch of people about this idea, and you would be amazed at how many people in the small town found use and value in that. And maybe it wasn't for a software idea, but they're like, man, I have this food truck business, or I have this restaurant, or I have this clothing store, and I would love to have a tool like that. You know, so yep. you can find need that is peripheral around what you're actually building. So again, we're kind of starting with the idea of software companies, startups, digital services, stuff that actually has code that could tie in some automation and information gathering built in rather than being a little bit more manual. Um, but I would love to, again, part of my whole grand idea was for any business <laughs> or something yep. like that, but their needs, just because they aren't a software company are very aligned with so many of those needs 
you know, a business itself isn't that different when it comes to, again, your product, your team, your customers, all those things are universal. And so just it's taking time to talk with people in your local community is so valuable. And then the other part we learned about quite a bit, I learned this new website called disboard.org, which yeah, is like searching really Discord cool. communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they give a few other ones. You want to kind of touch on those, Wyatt? Yeah. So yeah, the Discord and I can't remember the Twitter one. It allow it they're they're cool tools that just allow you to type in some easy keywords. It's kind of like SEO or search engine optimization, which used to be really hot years ago, not that long ago, probably SEO is, you know, top of everyone's chart. And it's it's cooled down because I think algorithms but I'm, I'm getting I'm getting away from myself. So there's there's fantastic tools out there that allow you to search for people with similar ideas. People who are talking the same thing. There's there's Reddit boards, there's Discord groups, there's Slack public Slack channels, there's Twitter, and there are tools that search those for you based off of keywords that allow you to find other groups and like minded people who are interested in the same thing. LinkedIn, I'm an avid LinkedIn user, been LinkedIn premium for years, love it. Shout out to LinkedIn. Give me a free subscription. But anyways, no, uh, you can find groups through really quick, easy searches. And those are the groups that you don't just want to go in and start spamming people with your business idea. Like, hey, visit my website and buy my product. That's not it. Because it goes back to what we said just five minutes ago. You find those groups, you go into them, and you add value. People will ask questions. And maybe one of those questions you have an answer to. And that can just start that conversation. You don't have to spam them with your with your website and your landing page. That's not the goal. No one wants that. No one cares. But what keep, people do care about is getting the right answer. I did see a funny. That reminds me. I saw a funny. I think it was on Reddit. It was someone who who said, uh, "I'm a software developer," and uh, it was, and as she says, "I'm a software developer." And for years now, anytime I've had a question about a specific thing or a specific code. I go and make a post asking the question, and then I go into an alternate account I have and answer it to myself incorrectly. And she said, no one cares to immediately give you free help, but everyone cares about correcting a wrong answer. And I thought that was genius. Just two accounts to argue and put wrong information. So people like, well, actually, uh, I thought that was brilliant. But anyways, you can search these groups out, add value to these groups, create the community, and then slowly you can begin to indoctrinate them into your product if that's if that's what you want. But once again, without being spammy. Yeah. Well, like you're saying, no one wants to be sold to, but everyone wants to help. And uh, gosh, that's such a clever life hack or business that hack. Was where funny. You're, you, we're going to have to do a test on that one. <laughs> like, yeah. What's the best way to start a company? And then just, yeah, completely throw out all the wrong answers or something like that. We should do that in the cohort or something like that. Oh, post on man. Now we probably should part. Do that. <laughs> but you know what? I did think of something, <clears throat> Tanner, yes. here towards you. Uh, I, I was, I, I'm a big fan of entrepreneur.com, inc.com, and I found a cool article labeled um, The Three Superpowers of a Second Time Founder. Hmm. And whether you like to believe it or not, Tanner, you are a second time founder. Um, and so it got me thinking. I read this article. Three things, very simple. First one is you trust your gut more than any other input. And uh, I, you can validate or not validate these, just your opinion. This is just the article. You trust your gut more than any other input, as in you can kind of tell when things may not be right. And maybe you need to adjust and change things because you've made mistakes before. Uh, the second is you can make bigger, bolder calls. You know when you have a bit more you can squeeze out of something or when you should hold back and maybe a little too risky. You have a better gauge for risk is, is, is essentially what that's saying. And then three, you can out-persist even your older former self. You can out-persist other people and you can out-persist even your old past self because once again, you've made those mistakes, you know that you can do better and you've learned better probably. Um, so I just wanted to quickly gauge, sorry to throw you into the spotlight without prepping you for this, but how do you feel your past experiences in entrepreneurship have helped prepare you for this one to make you better than when you were in your early 20s starting your last business? Well, let's go through each question independently. Read me the first one first. Yeah. First one is you trust your gut more than any other input. And once that's exactly what, you know, you, you've made mistakes before, you can kind of feel when something's going wrong earlier 
and maybe you can gauge a risk more appropriately because of your past experience. Every entrepreneur makes mistakes. I'm sure you've made mistakes in your past experiences, um, but now you, you have a stronger gut feeling. Yeah. I would say that one, it's true that you do have more data points. So, you know, so we are basically just pattern recognition machines. And so you're able to take past experiences and put them in. I would say that that could be a trap very easily though. There's so many times, and this is one of the things that I'd like to think of business as, is there's no roadmap for business because you have no idea what the future is going to look like. And I always love the Naval quote, you know, um, hearing what a successful person did is like them giving you their wedding lot lottery ticket numbers. You know, they struck it once in the past, but it doesn't mean those are the numbers going to come up again. So I am extremely big on um, informational based data decision, like information based decisions rather than mm -hmm. intuition, intuition based decisions. Um, you do need both because there's lots of time where you don't have the data, but if you rely, if you're a little too arrogant, I would think because, oh, I've done this. I remember that's just going to lead you to folly. So yeah. I don't, I agree that that's probably something that is very common, but I don't think that's, that part's necessarily a good thing. Okay, number two. Great, assess great assessment. All right. Second one, you can make bigger, bolder calls. Essentially, you know how the game's played a little bit more than the average Sure. For yeah. a startup person, and that means you 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 can gauge risk a bit more appropriately. You know when things are starting to go the wrong way, and you might need to adjust the sales, so to speak, a bit earlier than someone who has never been in an entrepreneurial sense like that. Yeah, bigger, bolder calls. Um, I would compare this to um, not having your head a little bit above the above water or being able to see the forest more through the trees so you're not quite as overwhelmed with the moment so you can see farther ahead okay. and so you can see or at least see more around you you're a little bit more calm um, how many times is it when you're not familiar with like let's say you get a new vehicle and you don't know where everything is you don't have quite the muscle memory left uh, or yet so you know, you're new to your surroundings. You're a little bit more precise, a little bit more cautious when you start. But when you, if it's your car, you've been driving it for 10 years, the car is just a part of you. Mm -hmm. And so much of business yeah. can be that too. So I, I think that part's very true. Love it. Okay. So the third one, you can out persist even your older former self. You know how much work it is to start a business. You are prepared to put in that work more so than some people who may have a great idea sit down at the computer, make a to-do list and realize, oh my gosh, this is a giant mountain I have to climb. You're prepared for that. Essentially, you understand the work you're going to have to put into this and, and you've, you've done it before, so you can do it again. Yeah. So that's just knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> so many times on any <laughs> small per particular issue. Um, again, it can get so easy to not see the exit, not see the door, not see how you're going to get out of that situation. Even terrible things, you know, like uh, there's legal issues that can come in all sorts. You can get sued. You, okay. If you have a retail company and someone gets injured in your store, that can lead to all sorts of headaches. There's all these things that just seem insurmountable when first time, but when you've done it, you know that you can get through it. And so that's, that's a huge part. The, so I, I agree with that one. It ended, the article ended is, but don't think that they know it all because there's some serious pitfalls to previous uh, entrepreneurs, second time entrepreneurs, second time founders. Uh, two specific things they said cracked me up when I read them. Unprocessed PTSD and overthinking. And I was like, oh man, that's why I was like, I'm going to save this and talk to Tanner. Let's be honest. Sometimes you overthink, right? Oh, that's, that's. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> that's everything in life though. And that's, that's honestly why I've been trying to be more present in the situation and just be more of a yep. doer rather than an analyzer, because again, I can't predict the future. And I, I think I've told the story before, but if you would try to visualize precisely what your dinner the next day is going to be like down to like where everyone sits, what's it's going to look like, what the conversation is going to be, what, how your plates are arranged, all, you know, trying to make it an exact movie, everything you do is going to be pretty wrong. 
everything yeah. that you visualize. So if you can't visualize dinner the next day in your own home exactly as it is, how the heck are you going to know exactly that conversation that's going to have happen with your boss, your someone else, a customer, um, the person who's angry at you or that you need to help solve their problem. There's no reason to stress over those things. You just got to, while you're doing it, do the best you can be genuine and it's going to work out. And if it doesn't, you'll learn a lot along the way. Yeah. And then there's lots of PTSD. Um, lots we can, PTSD. we can unpack that every single episode. Lots and lots of PTSD. Wonderful. All right, Tanner, why don't you bring it home? Last, 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 last thoughts. Yeah. I mean, ultimately this class has been fantastic. And again, I hope through our discussions, you know, whoever's listening to this can really pick apart maybe one or two nuggets and go with that. And if you do get something out of it, please reach out to us, you know, whether that be through LinkedIn, Facebook, email, um, we'll be getting our websites up here um, in the next few weeks, which is going to be great. So you'll have ways of filling out you know, like a contact us form or have a better way of reaching out to us. But we're really wanting to engage with the people who are listening. And then we're also really focusing on getting people in for interviews. Not that I don't love talking to you for 45 minutes each week, but <laughs> I, yeah, I'm starting to realize I only have so many like good nuggets <laughs> each uh, yep. week because I'm thinking in cycles and my cycles are probably more quarterly rather than weekly. Um, so I'm really, really excited to get new input, hear other people's stories, hear what they're working on and the great info that we, we can do is to bring ourselves forward as well as all of our listeners. That's it. Whether, whether it's this product we keep alluding to, whether it's this podcast, Tanner and I, we started with the sole mission of, we just want to add value. We want, and, and, and it sounds cheesy. It sounds cliche, but day one, when we started discussing this, all of these concepts, we generally started with, we just want to add value. If you find value in this podcast, thank you. Let us know, share, like this podcast, follow us on YouTube, that sort of thing. But we have lots in store too. We, we have so many plans, so many things we're going to be adding so many things to this podcast, making it better, the production value, the interviews, the information, all of that. And then if, if Tanner, you got nine days to be, get cracking on a landing page. Information is coming out. No, no pressure. Uh, we, we, we will continue to, I'm going to say the word again, iterate to only make things better because we just want to make something that someone says, you know what? That was cool. I liked that little nugget and I'm getting some of that feedback from you guys. So keep it coming. I love it. All right. Well, we'll call it for this week. We will see you all next time. Bye guys. Bye.